Well, hello everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com. And my voice sounds a little bit different this week because I'm just a tad under the weather. So I have very much of a Barry White, Isaac Hayes, Mike Rowe kind of voice today. <laughs> Secretly, I love it when I get sick like this though. I don't feel really sick. I'm like a little under the weather. I sound way worse than I actually feel, which is why I'm continuing to do Q&A. So thanks for bearing with me. But I secretly love when I get sick like this because my voice gets so much lower and I can like say and sing things that normally I wouldn't be able to, like the Grinch song and things like that. You know, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Like I can't normally get that low because I'm normally a tenor. But anyway, so it'll be an interesting Q&A. I haven't been like coughing a whole lot. If I was going to have coughing fits throughout the whole Q&A, I'd be a little more concerned. I may sip water every now and then just to keep my throat from drying out, but uh, other than that, I feel pretty good about doing a whole Q&A for you today. So I'm shooting this on Wednesday morning. I have a special guest coming today, John Lane from Pilot USA. I don't know that we're gonna be doing any video type stuff, um, but we're coming and doing some forecasting and blah, 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 boring things. <laughs> uh, boring on the entertainment side, really exciting for getting proper quantities of products. Uh, but anyway, so um, I'm gonna be shooting Q&A actually this Friday for the coming week as well because I'm gonna be out of town. I'll be on a business trip next week at the end of the week, like Wednesday through Sunday basically. So I won't be here to, short shoot, to shoot Q&A as normal, um, but I will um, still get it done for you. So I'll have that this week, so it won't be maybe quite as timely, but it'll still be good. Um, in Q&A today, I'm gonna be talking about ink sample longevity interviews and collabs, and then using food coloring as fountain pen ink. So it should be pretty interesting for you. Um, while I'm in New Orleans next week for my business trip, I wanna host a meetup. Um, so if you happen to be in the New Orleans area or be willing to drive to New Orleans, uh, I will be at the Nopsy Hotel right there in the heart of New Orleans uh, at 1 20, or, sorry, January 26th at 4.30 p.m. That's a Saturday, so next, not this weekend, but next weekend on Saturday at 4.30. You can follow me on Instagram. You can check uh, the Facebook group um, invite, the Facebook page invite that we have event. That's what it's called, Facebook event, that we've set up um, for more details, a specific address and stuff like that. But basically, it's just a low-key hangout. Bring some pens, bring your friends. Um, just while I'm there, might as well get to see some of my, um, you know, people in the Big Easy. So it should be fun. Um, we put out a blog this week uh, for Lamy Sneak Peek, so um, words getting out about um, some of the special editions and things like that that are coming in the first half of this year. Lamy is putting out more this year than I've ever seen them come out within a single year, so that's really exciting. I've actually known for uh, just a little bit, but we haven't been able to talk about it publicly yet, so we've got it out there now so you can get pumped. Um, we put out a video in right now on Wednesday for the Paniter Ink Alchemy set. I actually spent a little bit of time kind of playing with the ink and stuff like that. I won't belabor that by talking about it again here today, but I do want to point you to that video. Um, I did some nice ink mixing and stuff and, you know, I haven't, I haven't messed around with ink mixing too much in a while, but it's like a CMYK themed ink mixing set. It's pretty fun. Um, so you can check out more on how I did that. Um, we have some Monteverde Monza pens that we got on closeout. So these are individual pens, not the three set. Um, the three set we're going to carry on going with. They're closing out all the individual pens without the additional nibs. Um, so we got those. We're giving you a good deal on those. So check those out. Um, also got into the Pilot Vanishing Point Stripes. So that's pretty fun. Um, it's a more expensive version, but it's basically a it's an all metal um, rhodium plated version of the pen. Um, and it's got this nice kind of indentation. If I see if I can show you close up here. It's very shiny, so it's hard to see. But there, there you go. Really classy looking, like, you know, um, it's kind of thing that uh, it's not a super drastic deviation from the other pens that they have. I know there's been some questions about like, how slippery is it? Does the, does the fluting help give it a little bit of a grip? It definitely does. It, it can still be a little bit slippery kind of down the barrel of the pen because the flutes go that direction. Um, but for me, I would say it's a little bit, it's a little bit slippier, slip, slipperier um, than a normal VP, but not maybe as bad as you might think. So really looks nice though, I gotta say. It's a classy looking pen. So we have that now. Uh, we've been waiting for that for a while. Um, so you can check that out. We also got in the Esterbrook SD in Evergreen. 
lot of E words going on there. So we have that in both the gold and the green trim. Nice looking pen. A little bit of shout out to Penboy Roy here. So Penboy Roy rated this as his top pen of 2018, I think. Or the Estabrook SD in general. I don't know if it was the evergreen one, but either way. Nice looking pen. We just got them in uh, last week, I think, is when they announced it. So, um, yeah, you can check those out. And the oversized ones you can swap with um, vintage Estabrook's nibs if you have the adapter, which is pretty cool. So, Estabrook's been received pretty well so far. Pretty neat. Um, we also have the Lamy Crystal Inks that are going to be coming soon in limited quantity. We do not have enough uh, right off the bat. I will say that, but they should be following up with more. So, if you're on the email notification list for that, that is the way to go. And then another thing that we had this week was a Space Race Retro 51 restock. I very greedily kept a set for myself for historical purposes. The sets are all gone. They sold out in two minutes. But we still, at least as of Wednesday morning, have the individual pens that you can buy. Unfortunately, we didn't receive batches of individual pens with similar numbers on them. Otherwise, we would have tried to bundle them together but you can get Apollo, Gemini, and Mercury for yourself individually, assuming we still have them. The only reason I really shout it out is because um, this is the last of the batch that we're going to get. So once these are gone, that's it. So if you're hot on those, um, be sure to go make that happen. Um, and then a quick shout out um, this week, this coming week, uh, on Monday, we are going to be closed. Our office is going to be closed for the Martin Luther King Jr holiday. It's the first time that we're observing that holiday. Um, so Martin Luther King Jr. is a pretty cool dude. Um, stood up for some pretty cool stuff. And uh, we're going to observe that holiday as a benefit to our team, but also uh, in observance for um, all the wonderful things that he did. So pretty cool. Uh, so you won't get in touch with us on Monday. So if we happen to ship a package in or a day late, that's why. All right. So um, I'm going to try to have a slightly more abbreviated Q&A today just because of my voice, but I don't know, maybe you really like my voice and you would want me to do an extended one, but either way, that's not going to happen. Um, so let's start out with pen and writing questions. Kenneth S. on Facebook says, I keep hearing gold nibs being described as springy, but I'm having a hard time visualizing exactly what that is since I don't own any gold nib pens yet. Is there a way Brian could demonstrate this phenomenon, or is it one of those things you just have to experience in order to understand? Okay, it's very simple, really, and I can describe it and try and use my arms as visual aids, <laughs> but it's the kind of thing that it's pretty difficult to show without some like super tight macro stuff. So I'll talk to Andy, and maybe if she's really ambitious, can try to throw some B-roll over top of this, but I won't be able to uh, show you in any proper manner other than using my arms uh, here in Q&A today. So um, it's really very simple. A springy nib just means that the nib bends a little bit. And that's about it. It's got some give to it. So essentially, if you view my arm as the nib, right? This is the tip. Or here, here's the tip. And then this is the nib. It just means that when you hit the paper, the nib is going to kind of bend a little bit like this. So as you put pressure down on it, it just bends. That's it. When you have a flexible nib, okay, now my arms, if you're looking at, say, the surface of the nib, you know, here, the, here this is the tip. And then these are the tines. When you have a flexible nib and you're pressing on it, the nib actually flexes like that. So it actually spreads open and more ink flows. That's why the line looks wider and you get that line variation. That's a flexible nib, but that's not necessarily what's going to happen. If, it doesn't, if the nib is designed to flex like that, it opens up. But, and, and it does spring like that too, but um, a normal gold nib is not going to flex open like that. It's just going to more or less kind of bend as you put pressure on it. And the real, it's not so much a visual effect because it's honestly, it's very subtle. Um, but the bigger difference is in how it feels because believe it or not, you actually have a lot of sensitivity in your fingertips and in your hands. So you can really feel the difference between the springiness of a nib or the smoothness of a nib on the paper um, that is really impossible to show visually. Um, so I don't have a great way to show it, but that's something that uh, it, it makes a difference. And again, it's kind of subtle. It's sort of like I'm a terrible golfer, so if I use a really good set of golf clubs, I'm, I might just smack it slightly further into the woods. You know, <laughs> you won't notice a difference in my golf game uh, because I'm not refined enough to really know. So 
you know, people ask all the time, like, is a gold nib worth it? Is it not? And the truth is, like, yes, a gold nib is worth it if you can distinguish the feel of a gold nib to the feel of a steel one. But it's not necessarily the case for everybody. It's not like it has to be gold. Just like you don't have to drink a $200 bottle of wine. Most people can't tell the difference between a $20 bottle of wine and a $200 bottle of wine. So, no, you don't have to go that route. But um, if you if you have kind of a refined taste or you can notice a difference, then that's what it does. So, again, if you're happy with a steel nib and you don't notice anything missing in your life, I wouldn't say you need to bend over backwards, but um, I definitely am a fan of both. I use both all the time and enjoy them for what they are. All right, ink question. This is from Austin R. on Facebook. How will ink samples maintain their properties in ink sample vials? I guess I'm curious if I should use the whole sample within a specific time period or whether I can let them sit for a while. Uh, it's a good question. I have some samples that I've let sit for some time. Some of these are gifts that I get from other people. Some of them are ones that I've used. Um, I have not noticed any any marked difference. Granted, I haven't done like scientific, super scientific testing, um, but I haven't noticed a huge difference in ink samples um, that end up sitting there, especially with the type of vials that we have. They're a, they're a type of plastic that doesn't leach as much um, as maybe some others do. Uh, but it is a plastic vial, so plastic over a long period of time is going to leach moisture out of it. So at some point, there's going to be a cutoff to where it could affect the you know saturation of the ink and things like that. But um, it hasn't been anything that I've noticed that's happened in even probably a five-year window. So I don't know what you consider to be a while, but I think if you're holding on to ink samples for 10 years, 15 years, it's like, all right, you're you're pushing it a little bit there. You know, the main point of samples, what we originally created was for you to get them, try them, and then be able to, you know, get the bottle of ink and be able to test it. But I think for most people, you end up getting probably more sample vials than you would use right away. And maybe you want to revisit some over time. I think within most reasonable expectations of a timeline of how they will keep, they're going to be perfectly fine. If you're talking a decade or more, that's when I would kind of raise my hands in the air because I haven't even had any samples that long. So I don't know and I wouldn't guarantee that like these will last you your entire life. Um, but I think if you're looking within like a couple of years to maybe five year period, as long as it's sealed well and it's not like in direct sunlight where the light's just going to be bashing it and maybe changing the dye properties, I think as long as it's stored and reasonably kind of tucked away somewhere, um, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Cool? I'm going to grab a cough drop, if you don't mind. Not a sponsor, but I do prefer Ricola cough drops. Just the original, nothing fancy. I find that um, when I'm sick, I like to eat cough drops one after the other. So while other brands like Halls and some of the menthols might feel good once or twice when you have them back to back, they can wear on your throat a little bit and have a weird taste in your mouth. But Ricolas are pretty good, so anyway. They have no affiliation with me or Gooley Pens whatsoever. I'm just letting you know because I thought you might be curious. All right, this question is from Apollo Photography AP on Instagram. Is it smart to use food coloring as a fountain pen ink? I know a certain someone who does it all the time. All right, I don't know who certain someone you're referring to. The way you're implying it makes it sound like it's somebody that I should know, but I don't know who you're talking about. Um, so I did a little bit of research, watched a couple of videos, looked at Fountain Pen Network. I've heard a little bit here and there in the past about using food coloring as a fountain pen ink, as opposed, you know, I've heard of people using coffee and tea and wine and all kinds of other like food grade stuff because, frankly, you can get these things in a cheaper um, quantity, you know, cheaper per milliliter than you can a bottle of fountain pen ink. So that makes sense uh, why the question would come about. Um, it seems to be like the answer is yes and no. Um, at some level, it's not that different. It's water and dye. Of course, the type of water and dye and biocides and lubricants and other things like that. You know, fountain pen ink is not a amazingly complex, at least, tip. you know, some base fountain pen inks are not amazingly complex. There's some level of chemistry that's involved, and it's all rather proprietary, so I don't 100% know what every ink includes. Um, but largely, you know, you're talking ink, dye, water, um, some sort of salt solution, salinity, um, you know, some sort of biocide, um, and then uh, lubricant. So those are the main components of it, and what mixture and exactly what they are and how they play well together is what varies so much from ink to ink. 
Um, so I don't know the exact chemical composition, but I know that food coloring is not, it's not like it's putting, you know, paint into your pen. It's not like it's that different. Um, the degree of biocides, I believe, are different. So it's my understanding that food color may lack some of the sufficient biocides for regular pen use, though I've seen some videos of people that have used them regularly and have not had an issue. So I don't know if that's a universal thing or maybe just in their particular climate it didn't happen to um, get exposed. I know there's some brands like um, Urban, for example, they don't use any biocides in their ink and they seem to be okay. You gotta be super sterile in order for that to happen. Um, but that ha that's, that's possible. Um, it does lack some of the same surfactants and, some, and lubrication, so it may not flow quite as well. You're not gonna see as much shading and some things like feathering and um, bleeding, shading and, and stuff like that. Um, spreading on the paper uh, are probably gonna be different with, uh, with a food coloring as opposed to fountain pen ink. Um, and the degree of like permanence and light fastness is very much in question, so in terms of longevity, but you know, I will say that if it's something that you're going to be writing with and not keeping for very long, or writing and keeping closed and in like a journal where there's not light exposure, that's going to minimize a lot of that. It's definitely not going to be waterproof. Um, so, you know, I've, I've, in my research, I've actually seen it talked about more for use with inkjet uh, printers. You know, people using food coloring to replace their inkjet printer ink because per milliliter inkjet printer ink is the most expensive ink in the world. Um, but that's something, and a lot of them have computer chips and stuff now to prevent you from doing that, but um, that's, that's actually where more of the conversation came up. Um, but it's something that I would say you can, you can maybe experiment with, especially um, if you have an inexpensive pen that you don't really care about as much, and um, you're like a student or somebody that just needs to write something that's maybe not super permanent. Um, but cost effectiveness is your absolute priority. I would say, what have you got to lose? Um, as an authorized retailer, speaking from pen manufacturers, I know that food coloring is not something that is like condoned and recommended for regular use in fountain pens. So I would say it's definitely a use at your own risk kind of situation. Um, and you shouldn't plan on using it in any, you know, more precious or more expensive pens in your collection. But if it's something you just kind of want to mess around with, I say, what the heck? What have you got to lose? Um, but uh, another cool thing is because you can get some of the kind of basic colors, you can mess around with some ink mixing stuff. So if you want to go like the complete opposite end of the spectrum of the ink alchemy set, you could go like to the grocery store and get some food coloring, you know, in the different almost CMYK colors. And you can mess around and make your own stuff and just have a good time. Especially if you're doing like mixed media art and things like that. Um, it's not going to be light fast, but it could be still kind of fun for you. So um, I would say it's not something that, you know, long term you should consider like, I'm going to replace all my inks with food coloring, but it could be something fun to kind of mess around with if you're, if you're just bored and you want to do something kind of cool. Or maybe if you just want to see like, oh, what could be the right formulation for an ink color? You can try it with the food coloring first and then use it on a more expensive ink without having to experiment and possibly lose some of the more expensive ink in your experimenting. Okay. All right. Now I got some business questions. This is from J.G. Ilcher, J. Gilcher on Twitter. I liked the interviews you've done in the past, like Noodlers, Edison Pens, Penider, etc. Do you plan on doing any others in 2019? Uh, potentially, yes. I haven't really lined up anything. I have John Lane coming today as I'm filming this, um, but I don't know if I'm going to do him. He's talked a bunch, and I don't know if I'll put him on video again. We'll see. Um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, anytime that opportunity comes up and makes sense, um, I try to jump on that, but I haven't like 100% locked out, lined up um, much of anything in 2019 yet because the year is really just starting off. Um, you know, I'm looking to do a little bit of travel. I'm looking to do some various things. So certainly it's a possibility to line that stuff up. And I'll say without a shadow of a doubt, I'll have some kind of interviews lined up for 2019. Um, but a lot of them are like they coincide with travel that I'm already doing or have to make sense in terms of, you know, I don't like travel somewhere just to go interview somebody. Um, just don't have that kind of time. But, um, you know, maybe it'd be interesting to at least um, do some video interviews or something like that for anybody you're particularly interested in. So I kind of took this question partly to just be like, yeah, sure, I'm going to do that. But also to really solicit from you about like who I should look to do some interviews with. Who would you find com particularly interesting and compelling? Um, so yeah, leave, leave the notes in the comments and I'd love to know. 
Next question is from Eleanor Justice on Instagram. What kind of collaborations have been your favorite, special ink colors, etc.? And what's that process like? Is there a dream collab you'd love to do but haven't? So collaborations can take a lot of different forms. Um, each one's different, so it really kind of depends on who it's with. Um, what's tough is that most of them are virtual because we don't have, um, really other than Chet Herbert with Herbert Pens, we don't really have anybody here locally that we can get together with. Um, it may be the kind of thing like we see somebody once once a year or twice a year, maybe. Um, and then we can like maybe collaborate a little bit in person. That's part of the reason why, you know, I travel to different manufacturers and stuff like that is to see samples of products they have and talk about possible exclusives and collabs and stuff like that. But um, a lot of times it just has to be over email or over the phone or you know Skype or whatever it is um, to just kind of dream up ideas and then we end up having to mail samples back and forth and these types of things. So, um, you know, probably the process is a little less glamorous than you may think initially just because um, it's actually just a lot of logistics. There's a good brainstorming part and that's that part's really fun because you get to dream things up and a lot of times it's like, hey, what have you all had in development that you haven't released yet that we could possibly have as an exclusive? That's usually quicker to come to market. If we got to conceive something completely from scratch, you're looking probably at least six, nine months before something could come into fruition. So um, if we're just dreaming something up completely out of the blue, it could take quite a, quite a long time to develop. If it's something that like, oh, you've already got this capability, we could just have an, our own color or we could make a model out of a different material that you have set aside, cool, that is a little faster to do. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, some of my favorite ones that we've done, um, you know, anytime working with Nathan Tardif is a real experience. Uh, he's kind of a mad scientist, genius guy. Um, so a lot of times it's like, hey, Nathan, I've got kind of this raw idea. Can you come up with something and help work with me? And we'll go back and forth a little bit. And then he just dreams up something that's like, whoa, I never would have thought to tie this with that and have it come together. Um, you know, he's been pretty busy, so we haven't done a collaboration in a while. I have given him some ideas like May of last year, but not really a lot to come up with that. So, I mean, again, it's just time and and how busy he is and stuff like that. Um, Liberty's Elysium was really special, like just the way that came together. So that was one of my favorites. Um, the Visconti Opera Master Luna, which I have here. This is a really cool one from Visconti. This was one that was just kind of like a, a relatively quick one. And we've talked about this a little bit about how um, it was really Rachel's idea, but um, they had this material in one of their limited edition, uh, the Daedalus pen. And it was like, hey, what if we use that blue material in a different pen, brought the price point down, could fit and we we bought a lot of them knowing that we'd have it for a while we still have it um, normally with limited editions they tend to be a much shorter time frame this one we were okay having for a couple of years because we knew this material so special and it was blue and we just really wanted to to have it so that one was pretty cool um, anything with like Edison and Herbert pens you know Herbert is the recent one we still have a few of these left not a ton so this one's not gonna be around too too much longer but the Herbert Pens was cool because Chet's local and he's a, a pen maker, which speaks to my own roots. Um, so this is the Herbert Pen. If you haven't seen this one, it's called the Monument. Um, from stands for Monument Avenue, which is um, one of the main roads through our city of Richmond here. And uh, it's with his paper ribbon material, um, which he custom made the material. We designed it together, went back and forth. <laughs> I put a black nib on mine, um, which doesn't come with that, but I put one on there anyway, because this is one that I custom ground. Um, so I kind of adopted it myself, but anyway, um, this was pretty cool just because Chet's a, you know, I want to say small time, but he's up and coming pen craftsman. So anytime I get to work with kind of somebody who's up and coming, it always speaks back to my pen making days and the things that I was able, never able to do at kind of like selling at scale as a pen maker. So that's pretty cool getting to work with, you know, folks like Herbert and Edison. And uh, I always get to get like a little deeper into like the technical and the materials and how their lathes work and all this kind of stuff. I can talk deeper with them on that because they know all the nitty gritty details and I love that stuff. Um, ones like the monograph of shiny lines that we did, we're out of these now, but like just the materials, fantastic. You know, being able to revive an old nib that came off a really special pen and then incorporating that into other design elements. That was really cool to be able to get to do that. Do things like coming out of a celluloid grip, which is not super common for them. Um, so that was really neat. Just being able to work with more of a luxury brand, a premium brand, and dream up something neat was really was really fun. 
I think in terms of things that I would really like to do but haven't, um, it'd be cool to do an exclusive with, you know, Twisby or Lamy or Pilot. Those are some of our bigger companies, bigger brands that we deal with. Um, you know, of course, they get a lot of attention. To be able to do something exclusive with them would definitely be like a sense of, you know, we've made it a little bit. Um, you know, not to say that any of these other ones haven't made us feel that way. Certainly working with like Monograph and Viscani have felt that way too in their own right. But, you know, companies, larger ones like these could be really cool. Um, uh, so that would be neat. I don't know if that'll be a possibility, but I'm, I'm always bringing it up. Um, and then um, I do have one project in the works um, that I can't talk about yet because it's actually happening and I don't want to spoil it. Um, but it's something that um, it, there was a special order we did for a pen years ago. Um, and I like the pen so much, I actually shot a video on it. We didn't even sell the pen regularly. Um, it's still out there. I'm not going to say what it is. I'll let you guess. But um, I did a review of this one particular pen, and we're trying to bring it back in a limited capacity. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about it. So that would be really cool, just for me personally, because I just really liked that pen. Um, and then, of course, I'm a huge fan of Jake Weidman and his amazing artwork. Um, so anything that I could do to collaborate with him in a product in the future would be really cool for me. So those are just some rough ideas. None of these are like panned out, fleshed out, but um, just top of mind kind of stuff. And the last question I have for you this week is all things epistolary on Instagram. Have you ever thought about carrying pen rests? Um, sort of, sort of. Like, um, you know, I was in contact with um, this guy, Brad Shoot, Shooty, um, and he makes these pen rests. These are pretty cool. Um, they look really nice, but he's he, you know, works at Dollywood. He was at a pen show, so it's the kind of thing like you can stick your pen in here, and it looks really cool. Um, it has different colors. Um, he just couldn't make them in quantity. So this is something in the future I would love to carry, um, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, I have another one. This was just from an independent um, glass maker um, that he sent me one, and um, the price point was a little higher for this one. This was like $125 or something. And I was like, I don't know if that's going to be possible. And he was just an, an individual person too. So that's a tough thing about a lot of pen rests is a lot of them are just made by individuals. You know, I'm a fan of Mike Dudek um, and Clicky Post. So I have, um, you know, one of his little planters here. He had a piece of wood that he had on his um, Instagram um, that had a nice knot in it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I like the character of the knot. Can you make me one around that? And he did. So that's kind of cool. But again, he has a full-time job and just does that on the side. So it's the kind of thing that I found that with a lot of the pen rests, um, it's really small, you know, small, um, I hate to say small timers. That sounds so derogatory. That's not what I mean. But, you know, it's, it's people that are independent craftsmen who um, just can't make things at scale to sell to retailers like us. So um, it's the kind of thing that I would be interested in. I may be curious who you've seen that you would be interested. Um, Penwell is another one. I actually talked to um, the guy who founded Penwell um, the other day on the phone because, you know, it came up. We have a Slack channel in our company. So, like, anytime you are requesting things on Instagram or YouTube or through email to our team on the phone, whatever, um, we put it into the Slack channel as like new item suggestions. So like Penwell came up and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I looked at their website, you know, reached out to the guy and he was like, yeah, it's not a full-time gig for me, you know, but maybe I could go that way in the future. So it's like, all right, cool. So we'll just kind of like be in touch. Um, you know, so a lot of times that's what ends up happening with these pen rests is it's people who are making them on the side. It's like their side hustle because you think about it, fountain pens themselves are already pretty niche. And then when you get into you know, accessories and support items for fountain pens, you're now into like a subset of a subset of a niche. So it's, um, it's the kind of thing that I don't, I think it's difficult for people to make really at, at scale enough to be able to offer to, you know, full distribution. But there's some really cool and interesting things out there on like Etsy and Kickstarters and some other things like that. So I always have that kind of stuff on my radar. You know, Zach Zaguri is one of the only ones that I can think that has them available. He has like the Atlas one and like the Knight that's like holding up the pen. And that's the only ones that I've seen. I haven't made any contact with them. That's something we could carry um, theoretically, but um, that's really the only one realistically that I can think of. So I would love to know if you have any um, that you would like uh, me to see and then maybe I can pursue them or something like that. So again, very I'm, I'm asking you for a lot of information in this Q&A today uh, because I'm really just kind of curious. 
Uh, and that's it. That's it for today. My voice is clearly degrading as I go along, so I'm going to give it a little bit of a rest. But even still, I'm glad I was able to shoot this for you today. This will be a nice, nice short, nice brief one if you even stuck it through to the end on this one anyway. My question of the week this week is, what is the most important property of an ink to you? Is it shading? Is it water resistance? Is it, you know, the color itself? Is it the dry time? I'm just very curious to know, what is it that you find most important when you're looking for an ink? So if you leave that in the comments as well, that'd be great. Should be lots of good feedback in the, in the comments this week. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for bearing with me through my illness today. I hope you've enjoyed this one. You can check out more information on a lot of what I talked about here on GoulayPens.com. Subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching and right on.